Greetings fellow showerers and showerees. I'm Dr. Steph and I did my PhD on a history of showers. In my thesis, I reveal how showers, an everyday object that people use to clean and preen their bodies, are part of big picture systems that govern our lives. Today we are going to visit the shower room, a space in which a group of people are expected to strip off and wash in front of each other. It's an extraordinary thing to do in today's world, and it has a fascinating forgotten history connected to governing populations through collective action and the idea of rights. Showers are a familiar part of the bathroom landscape. However, as we discussed in episode one, the birth of showers, manufactured showers first emerged from in the walls of early 1800s asylums with a purpose quite different to that of washing. Towards the end of the 1800s, the idea of clean skin being connected to health had started to emerge and physicians began designing warm water shower rooms to keep enclosed populations, such as those in asylums and prisons, healthy and productive. In my research, I used the ideas of French philosopher Michel Foucault to explore the historical arrangements that made the shower a thinkable thing, and then eventually an actor in a daily activity we carry out as part of our private lives. In this episode, we will explore a period of radical change in the design and use of the shower that was the product of changing ideas regarding population health and warm water during the late 19th and early 20th century, which led to the creation of the shower room. In 1871, Dr. Bresgen, a Prussian army doctor, invented a shower bath facility to wash the skins of the 15 men that made up an army division. Following his instructions, the soldiers of an army could be washed within a matter of minutes. Division showering was scheduled once a week to coincide with the laundry. Each division would be marched to the shower cells enter a cell and follow the command, sliding doors closed, undress, followed by enter, then to the shower attendant, taps on. After three minutes, the attendant turned the taps off. The attendant was required to check with the troops doctor what temperature the water ought to be and to monitor the warmth. Every four weeks, a medical examination should take place, adding the command, sliding doors back, following which the doctor did his inspection of each soldier's skin. Once they had been inspected, they may close the door to get dressed, and the final command, sliding doors back, dismissed, was given. At the time Bresgen's shoulder, soldiers were being marched into the shower bath facility, washing the skin was uncommon and had been considered potentially dangerous. His soldiers needed to be marched to the shower and inspected by the physician rather than being permitted to shower using their own free will. So what was Bresgen thinking by subjecting his soldiers to this idea of washing? And what was the justification for the costly new building that he invented? We must go back a bit further to the 1830s and the time of the cholera epidemic to understand how water, washing, hygiene and the good of the nation came to be connected.
While there is some evidence that showering was practiced in ancient Rome, the idea of washing the skin to prevent disease is really very modern. Ward, in his 2019 book, The Clean Body, A Modern History, explains that during the 17th century, concerns about the spread of disease via miasma, or a sort of foul air, suggested that offensive body smells could be a threat to health. However, it was not until the early 19th century that daily bathing started to be suggested. A pivotal moment in the creation of our modern idea of washing emerged out of the cholera epidemic of 1832. As the disease spread through Europe and America, an urgent need arose to stop the population from dying. Following on from the Age of Enlightenment, new scientific methods were being used to understand the pandemic. Rather than examining the disease as it presented in a body, doctors started examining the spread of disease through a population. A publication called the Cholera Gazette published how many people were sick or dead in various locations and recorded basic information such as the ages of the diseased. While this idea might seem obvious to us today, disease had previously been the problem of the individual and a cost to the family. The king had left the lives of his subjects in the hands of God. However, modern government took a keen interest in maintaining a healthy, working population. Although there was still debate at the time about whether cholera was contagious, populations with access to clean water and the facilities for personal and house cleaning were found to fare more favourable than those who did not. The cold shower was suggested as a hydropathic practice for strengthening one's constitution to prevent susceptibility to cholera. The cold bath or shower bath and moderate exercise in the open air are advantageous in strengthening the constitution and in lessening the liability to the epidemic influence. The tepid bath in persons of debilitated habits would be better than the cold. However, it was the connection between water and cleanliness that really took hold. In England, the state's interest in keeping the population clean led to the widespread establishment of shower baths for the public. The first public freshwater bath and wash house was built in Liverpool in 1842, following the efforts of Kitty Wilkinson. Kitty was reported to have reduced the spread of cholera by providing laundry services to the sick. These public baths included shower baths, and aimed to provide a collective space in which working class families could wash, according to Bailey in 1852, without the annoyances and discomforts felt by the working man especially of washing at home. At this time, private dwellings were being connected to water supplies in some parts of the world but most households did not have access to clean hot water in the way that many of us do today. So in England, this new idea that the nation should have an interest in how clean the bodies and sheets of its people are, led to the building of these costly public facilities. While kings and governments had previously invested in the security of the nation by building armies and barricades, Investing in cleanliness was groundbreaking, but they were still actually an investment in security, economic security too. Osborne, in his chapter of Foucault and Political Reason, Liberalism, Neoliberalism and Rationalities of Government, explained that from the 1830s, public health and sanitary science were conceived as means of security forms of government that saved on interventions and costs in other sectors of the social order. Disease was a wastage. 
Providing showers within public baths created a milieu in which the working class could be transformed into a more favourable population, cleaner in body and spirit, fit for connection to the apparatus of production. A committee was formed and they stated that the main object of the general committee was the promotion of the health and cleanliness of the working class and, as a necessary consequence, the improvement of their social condition and the raising of their moral tone, thereby rendering them more accessible to and better fitted to receive religious and secular training. While the promoters of public baths may have intended the shower to normalise the population, the effects were limited to those who chose to use the facilities. According to Ward, the baths were somewhat of a success in England. In its The Liverpool's Baths first year, it provided 11,000 baths and its second over 16,000. Impressive growth but still a small number for a city of more than 250,000. By the end of the century, studies found that the percentage of the population that regularly bathed remained low in Britain and America. So it would seem there was little inducing the working class into the shower at that time. While they may have had limited success, it was an important shift in thinking that resulted in local or state government funding of such facilities. It established the principle that the state shared some responsibility for the cleanliness of British bodies. Shower baths and public bathhouses could operate on the skins of the working class and Great Britain became seen, according to Ward, a beacon of sanitary enlightenment. At the dawning of the 20th century, few people bathed regularly due to issues of cost and convenience, and in some cases, a lack of desire to wash. However, this did not mean that collective bathing facilities faded into obscurity. In the next part of this episode, I discuss the emergence of showering for hygiene in army camps and miners' facilities. These showers were designed to reduce the incidence of disease within particular populations, but they employed very different governmentalities to induce subjects to wash. While the working population was being encouraged to wash through the availability of public showers, Within confined collective spaces, such as army barracks, discipline was being used to create nations of showerers. In 1871, a booklet translated for me by Anita Gothens, Alexander Bresgen, Royal Prussian Medical Officer, proposed that the improvements in the health of the troops he had observed when they had access to rivers to swim in was due to the cleaning effect the water had on the skin. Bresgen, along with other doctors at this time, believed that the skin functioned to assist the lungs by discharging vapours and other substances from the blood. Cold and humidity were thought to suppress these functions, causing lung disease. He believed that the nervous system, metabolic processes of the body and life itself relied on warmth and the skin played a vital function in detecting harmful changes in temperature. He argued that frequent warm baths were beneficial for health, both to prevent and treat disease, with spray baths being more effective due to their ability to penetrate more deeply. He proposed that frequent washing was economical in terms of the savings to be made through the health of the troops, reduced the use of soap, improved longevity of bedsheets and uniforms. Washing was also argued to improve morale, the mental and physical capacity of soldiers, and shortened training periods. The method that Bresgen developed for washing the skins of soldiers 
was a circular shower system. Breskin's shower bath facility accommodated an entire division, 16 soldiers, with the water basin holding enough water for five divisions. This allowed 80 soldiers to be washed and dressed in 30 to 40 minutes. The circular design allowed routine inspections of the whole body by the physician. The only possible way, Bresgen claimed, to accurately diagnose a range of diseases such as scabies and syphilis. Ordinarily, Bresgen argued, the time taken to inspect the troops for these conditions and the violation of privacy had made such inspections impossible. Bresgen proposed that the shower bath facility, combined with a series of military commands, as described earlier in this episode, would allow the doctor to examine the body of each individual soldier, a task made easier following the removal of dirt from the skin. Through the shower, the skin of the soldier does a recursive object upon which the physician can act. Interestingly, Breskin had noted that medical inspections could be a violation of privacy if they were not done in his shower facility. He connects his shower design with privacy, and while he is not explicit as to how this design produces medical inspections that are private, it is perhaps preventing the soldiers from seeing each other through his design that eliminates this violation. In addition to the shower acting on the skin, Bresgen proposed that the soldier, as a creature of habit, would become a transformed subject through the therapeutic operations of his shower bath facility. He proposed that the showered soldier could continue with du the duty to wash his skin when he returned home, providing great benefits to the entire nation. Furthermore, the soldier was then likely to induce and encourage his family and friends to wash. This would result in decreases in disease and death, improve the efficiency and strength of the labour force, and increase wealth for the individual and the nation. In the mid to late 1800s, showers emerged almost simultaneously in army barracks in Prussia and in prisons in France, as we discussed in episode one. These enclosed spaces were governed with something Foucault called anatomo-political discipline. Foucault, in Discipline and Punish, The Birth of the Prison, describes, the historical moment of the disciplines was the moment when the art of the human body was born, a policy of coercions that acted upon the body, a calculated manipulation of its elements, its gestures, its behaviour. The human body was entering a machinery of power that explores it, breaks it down and rearranges it. A political anatomy defined how one may have hold over others' bodies, not only so that they may do what one wishes, but so that they may operate as one wishes, with the techniques the speed and the efficiency that one determines. Thus, discipline produces subjected and practiced bodies, docile bodies. Discipline produces docile bodies that through several techniques, beginning with an uninterrupted, constant coercion, supervising the process of the activity, Constant supervision is enhanced by the creation of spaces such as schools, factories, sports facilities, prisons and army barracks in which the subject can be brought together and more easily overseen. A whole disciplinary apparatus is formed to produce bodies and body parts that perform and through that performance are more productive. The collective and confined space of the Army Division Shower Bath Facility was a protected space in which each individual constituting part of the collective becomes knowable and may be ordered, processed, measured and improved. 
Skin became an object that needed to be known and acted on. It became thought of as something that could transmit disease, health, moral and mental, and physical productivity to the body through its connection to warm water. The design of these showers and the effect of water sloughing away dirt from the skin produced a soldier with his skin visible to the physician. Confined to a cell, his nakedness was hidden from his peers, but visible to the medical gaze. The soldier is a showeree, an object who is showered. However, the repeated practice of showering using military drill aims to reconstitute the soldier into an educated showerer, one who chooses to shower himself. We will return to the idea of discipline and shower room later in this episode. However, next we will discuss a very different group shower that materialised in Aotearoa, New Zealand in the early 1900s to reduce the incidence of disease in minors. In 1908, the New Zealand Workers' Compensation Act was passed. This act required employers to compensate workers who were disabled from disease or injury resulting from their employment. However, as a result of that act, mining companies sought to limit their liabilities and demanded that all miners be subjected to medical examination and fired if found not to be healthy. This led to the threat of strike action later that year, and in 1911, a Royal Commission was established to inquire into and report on the conditions relating to the health and safety of the miners of New Zealand. The report from the Royal Commission of Mines recommended the provision of showers or changing rooms and baths for miners at larger mines to prevent miners' disease. As part of their inquiry, the Commission consulted physicians who concluded that fibrosis was caused by silica dust, while tuberculosis was caused by bacterium passed from person to person via sputum and most likely contracted outside of work. Various actions to reduce disease were proposed by the Commission, which included sprays to reduce the dust in mines, prevention of indiscriminate spitting, disinfection of workplaces, and the use of bath and changing houses. Physicians interviewed by the Commission were uncertain about the factors that were the cause of the disease in some miners. But overexertion, resulting in a loss of vitality, was thought to be a factor, as was walking home in cold and wet clothing. Provision of baths and changing facilities were proposed to mitigate this risk. While physicians advocated for bathing facilities, there was some dispute as to whether, whether miners would make use of them. The 1912 Commission reported that in mines where baths were available, a lack of privacy and cleanliness had meant they were avoided. However, one mine manager interviewed believed the miners did not want to shower and stated, you would have to tie them down to get them under the water. The Commission interviewed miners, most of whom indicated that they would use showers. They found a consensus that a ratio of between one shower to four or one to eight miners would be sufficient and help reduce costs, as there was a general agreement that not every miner would choose to wash. While some were not concerned about whether they were provided with a shower or bath, a discourse of showers being more economical to build, cleaner and possibly preferred by miners resulted in showers being suggested. Showers within workplaces such as factories had been established in Europe and the USA by this time. 
Their design included shower rooms very similar to Dalabost's prison ablution system, discussed in episode one, where the showerers were separated from each other within a shower facility, but visible from the outside. The miners' shower suggested was quite different. This is the Royal Commission of Mines 1912 suggested design for changing room and baths for miners. While the name would suggest that baths were recommended, the design was actually for a shower block with laundry facilities. The suggested design provided a ratio of showers of 5 to 1, 10 showers for a shift of 50 men. Four of the 10 showers were labelled private, while six of the showers were separated into two shared shower rooms. Movable seats in an open collective space were included to assist with dressing and undressing. A screen blocked the view into the space from the entrance. A wall and door separated the showers from the changing area with an additional wall and door within the shower space to separate the private showers. Wash tubs for clothes and a pulley system with padlocks were suggested for suspending clothes for drying. The floor was concrete with drains and gutters designed to remove the water. Heating pipes ran along the wall and down to the shower heads. The shower walls were lined with corrugated iron. The changing room and baths for miners was very different to Breskin's Army Division shower bath facility in which all of the showerees were separated from each other. The miners' showers and changing rooms were a collective space. Although private showers were available, they were designed in a way that required the private showeree to pass through the collective shower space. An unwillingness to be naked in front of one's colleagues was seen to be an abnormality by one of the mining inspectors. Some men have a decided objection to stripping in front of others through some affliction. However, miners had indicated that a lack of privacy had dissuaded them from using bathing facilities in the past and they desired privacy when bathing. As to bathhouses and change houses, I think each mine should be provided with bathhouses. And each man with a separate bath? Yes, a stall closed off. I do not see why a miner should bath before a crowd. They do not allow it in any other place. Private showers were preferred and possible. So what could the purpose of the collective space be? The Commission did not explain its rationale for the collective shower room and the inquiry does not describe any findings that would justify a collective shower space. Perhaps the design was connected to financial prudence. Showers were argued to be cheaper than baths. So maybe the cost of 10 doors had been considered against the cost of six. I argue that while economics was a consideration, these shared spaces were designed to op operate a democratic governmentality aimed to induce miners to shower and to do so efficiently. Compared to the soldiers of the Prussian army, miners were not compelled to shower through military drill. Indeed, as noted previously, concerns had been raised that the provision of such facilities were a wasted expense to the company, as the miners would not use them. The legislation that resulted from the Royal Commission of Mines report, the Coal Mine Amendment Act 1941, ensured that although the installation of changing and bathing facilities was at the company's expense, they were only required to install them if a sufficient number of miners voted for their installation and they then put them to use. While miners generally desired showers, the collective relied on the individual's interests supporting the shower, 
since they would only be supplied if individual miners voted for and used them. In contrast to Bresgen's 1871 Army Division shower bath facility, in which the body was an object to be made visible to the physician's inspection, but hidden from other soldiers, in the collective spaces of the changing rooms and baths for miners, the miners are visible to each other. Such design could induce the miners to shower, making visible those who were and who were not showering, ensuring that the interests of the collective were known, as were the individuals whose interests were not aligned with the collective. Gerard, in 1908, who I discuss further in episode three, was explicit about this effect of visibility on the discipline of showerers. His design for rain baths in schools emitted subdivisions that his rain bath compartment for adults had, stating, I also hold that the educational effect of having the children undressed together in one large dressing room should not be entirely lost sight of, for, as already intimated, this fosters habits of neatness in regards to undergarments. For old girls, it may be desirable to provide simple curtains for greater privacy. In contrast to the problem of providing showers that miners would not use, the Commission found others who were worried that miners who did use showers may occupy them for too long. This was argued to be a further waste of resources and would mean that there would be insufficient water to provide showers to all. One of the miners suggested that an awareness of their fellow miners waiting to shower would mitigate this potential risk. You stated that one bath would be sufficient for six men? Yes. How long would you consider it would take one ma man to have a shower bath? It all depends on the man himself. But as a rule, Men do not monopolise a bath when they know others are waiting. They are very kind to one another in that respect. There is no attendant to turn the taps off. Rather, the miners must be induced to keep their showers short. The collective space makes the showerer and those who are waiting to shower visible to each other. Recognition of the interest of others ensures that individual miners keep their showers short, comprising their self-interests so as to not make their fellow man wait. Rather than discipline, the shower relies on a democratic governmentality, illustrating how big picture ideas about how we should be governed can be seen in an everyday activity such as showering. In Crookshank's 1996 chapter, Revolutions Within, Self-Government and Self-Esteem, from the book Foucault and Political Reason, proposed that since the birth of mass democratic forms of government in the 1830s, a particular form of governmentality, one in which groups are used to supervise and, advise and discipline themselves, has been employed. Although democracy may grant freedom to citizens, as isolated individuals, they're relatively powerless. To achieve their interests, citizens have to act collectively. Thus, persuading citizens to tie their self-interests and their fate to society voluntarily was the key to stability without the use of force. Artificially created associations, such as unions, workers sharing a shift, or even a group using a facility at once, are useful for cementing the individual citizens' desires and goals to a vision of what is good for society. With no apparent coercion or centralised state action, voluntary associations ensured a united citizenry and a stable society. To achieve this, venues constructed for citizens to take care of organising and governing themselves became necessary. 
And such collective confined spaces, such as the changing rooms and baths for minors, individuals could sense and enforce their dependence on each other. This produces an awareness that small acts of self-denial, such as taking a shower, even if one does not want to, or cutting one's shower short, are tied to desires of the collective. With each miner's interests tied to the interests of the collective, showering is under the surveillance of the group and does not need to be enforced by the state or the mining company. The collective space creates the camaraderie that democratic government relies on, and collective showering became the established way of things. Camaraderie is defined by the sharing of a room. Comrade, camaraderie means one who shares the same room, hence a close companion. The changing rooms and baths for minors produced and were produced by subjects who are part of a collective. While Cruikshank does not discuss the idea of rights, there's an interesting connection between the idea of rights and democratic government that is revealed by the connection between miners and showerers. By the time of Cochrane's Royal Commission of Miners report, mining unit unions had established the idea of collective action to uphold workers' rights to smooth the harsh effects of liberal capitalism. However, originally a miner's right was a physical piece of paper that granted an individual permission to mine and made the right holder eligible to vote in state elections. While initially every miner was required to have their own right, after a time these rights could be held collectively. Later, companies could buy rights off individuals and paid wages to the miners. Disputes over such wages resulted in the formation of miners' unions and eventually the idea of the miners' right transformed from an individual claim to a mine and its profits to the right of a wage-earning workers' workers' rights as collective resistance to capitalist exploitation. Thus, ideas of individual interests being tied to collective interests in the form of rights and democratic practices such as voting for the shower were connected. I return to this idea of rights as a claim to territory in the following episodes. But for now, in the final chapter of this episode, we will discuss how only 70 years after Bresgen had started marching army divisions to his shower facility for skin inspections, showers have, showers have become an established feature of army camps and came to be a spoil of war and described as a desirable luxury that entrepreneurial soldiers sought out on the front. As noted earlier, Bresgen, the Prussian army physician, had in 1871 proposed that his system could be used in a variety of situations and hoped that showering would proliferate. Showers were available in Aotearoa New Zealand army barracks from at least 1900. The idea of bathing or showering for body cleanliness had become so well established that by 1929, the Geneva Convention relative to the treatment of prisoners of war required countries to provide showers for their prisoners of war. The convention from 1929 stated in chapter three, article 13, in relation to sanitary services in camps that Prisoners of war shall have at their disposal day and night installations conforming to sanitary rules and constantly maintained in a state of cleanliness. Furthermore, and without prejudice to baths and showers, 
with which the camp shall be as well provided as possible. Prisoners shall be furnished a sufficient quantity of water for the care of their own bodily cleanliness. By the beginning of World War II, showers were a basic element of the Aotearoa New Zealand Army camp. Newspaper articles from the late 1300s promoted showers as a feature of camp life that brought pleasure to army personnel in training camps and on the field. Rather than being an aspect of military drill, showering was conceived as a luxury. But it was not yet time to rest. Palisades had to be filled and beds made up for the night. Then the bliss of a shower. There was no more popular spot in the camp than the huge shower rooms where men could strip and revel in the luxury of unlimited hot and cold water. In the army camp, the shower is a collective space, similar to the changing room and bath for miners, in that it is a space for camaraderie. Soldiers were seemingly freed from the medical discourse of order and surveillance that originally connected soldiers to Bresgen's showers. This was a space to revel rather than to wash away disease. Although citizens may have been joining the army as a duty to the nation, a discourse constituting the shower as a reward had emerged. Out in the field, away from the authority of the physician, entrepreneurial individuals used natural water supplies and whatever materials were available so that troops could enjoy the luxury of a shower bath's hydropathic pleasures. Showering was not, however, simply a luxury. By this time, it was seen as an essential part of the war effort, reducing disease and necessitating the creation of showers that could be taken with the army while the troops were on the move. The New Zealand Army invented an experimental squadron portable shower bath which could be packed down and shipped out. In 1942, a shower unit was the documented spoil of war for one New Zealand field hygiene section fighting in Libya. In Trobuck, for the New Zealand field hygiene section salvaged repaired and put into use a captured Italian mobile shower unit, thus equipping itself with a complete disinfestation plant. This Italian shower unit would be claimed and renamed the New Zealand Field Hygiene Section Shower Unit, pictured here. Entrepreneurial soldiers even produced their own showers out of whatever materials were available. Showers maintained their hygiene function as a complete disinfestation plant for diseases connected to the skin, such as typhus, venereal diseases, and other skin conditions. However, a discourse of showers as a luxury sought after created or captured by the entrepreneurial soldier, suggested a very different governmentality to anatomo-political discipline. The shower became an asset, material capital that one could use to invest in clean skin. By the start of World War II, cleanliness had become more than a technology used by the physician. It was an aesthetic asset personal capital that the soldiers themselves sought out. We will discuss this idea of showering and personal capital further in As the next episode. this article from 1944 reads, Army beauty shops, frontline troops, showers and new clothes. Newly developed beauty shops on the 5th Army front in Italy are lifting the troops' morale in a big way, says the Associated Press correspondent. Going right up as the front line moves forward, these beauty shops, which have been dubbed revival tents by the soldiers, receive the fighting men who have been relieved temporarily from the front line. 
the men go into the revival tents battered and mud splattered and in less than an hour later emerge after having had a shower and shave wearing clean underclothing and new uniforms the battle weary troops are hardly recognizable as they leave the beauty shops the soldiers regard the new underwear and the uniforms as a real present but the best treat of all is a hot shower which is the last thing they expected to find near the front line. While hygiene showers were established to reduce the incidence of disease, the warm hygiene shower was also associated with improving morale and revitalizing the will. Warm water and clean skin were seen to have a normalizing effect. With the previous battle on the front line washed away, the soldier was renewed and ready to fight again. The discourse that connected World War II soldiers to luxury showers is interesting, as it employs a governmentality whereby soldiers are constructed as free, rational subjects who have a self-interest in showering. Being clean revives them. It is a treat a luxury that they seek out to improve their human capital. However, the state also has an interest in the hygiene function of the shower to maintain the health and productivity of its soldiers. In terms of design, the soldiers' shower rooms were open shower rooms that appear similar to the changing rooms and baths for minors in that the showerers are visible to each other. This suggests a desire for the showerer to be showered with the interests of the collective in mind. Provision of showers would therefore seem to also employ a democratic governmentality. While pairing the highly disciplined army context with a democratic governmentality might seem problematic, in fact, this interplay is a feature of modern government. Birchall, in a chapter also from Barry, Osborne and Rose's 1996 Foucault and Political Reason, Liberalism, Neoliberalism and Rationalities of Government, explain, Government, Foucault suggests, is a contact, contact point where techniques of domination and techniques of the self interact, where technologies of domination of individuals over one another have recourse to processes by which the individual acts upon himself and conversely where techniques of the self are integrated into structures of coercion. The soldiers showers were one set such contact point, a space in which the individual soldier acts upon himself to maintain his own interests and the hygiene of the army, with an element of coercion due to the visibility of each individual soldier to the group. However, it's apparent that the luxury shower is part of a wider dispositive connected to beauty and human capital. While visibility to other soldiers supplied some inducement to shower, as I discuss in the next episode, the idea of body cleanliness as capital had become established and the shower was transformed from the original cold water torture to an object of desire.